Hello everyone. In November 2018, the Australian Electric Vehicle Association Queensland Division, with the support of government and private sector sponsors, held the Electric Vehicle Exhibition at the Brisbane Convention Centre. An event like this is fantastic as it raises awareness of many different aspects around electric vehicles by providing access to industry experts who share their knowledge and answer the audience's questions. This video is only one part of the conference that went over two days, so if you're enjoying it, consider checking out some of the other excellent presentations. If you'd like to attend one of the monthly get-togethers to learn more about electric vehicles, the Queensland meeting is held on the third Wednesday night of each month at the Albion Peace Centre, 102 Macdonald Road in Windsor, with a 7.30 start time. And don't forget to check out the AEVA's website, which is linked in the description below. Enjoy the video, and I'll see you on the next one. And please welcome David. Well, good morning, everybody. After that introduction, I didn't realise my whole CV was going to be read out, but uh, thank you very much for that warm uh, welcome. And welcome to Brisbane, those of you who have come from interstate. interstate uh, welcome to Brisbane. We always love seeing these uh, conventions and events here at, uh, at the BCC. It's fantastic to see uh, so many people here to learn about electric vehicles and all of you who are involved in that industry. Thank you for it. Uh, as, uh, as was said, I'm the Chairman of Council's Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee. I'm here uh, as a proxy for the Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, who couldn't be here today, but he sends his warm regards. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have achieved some significant sustainability milestones in recent years. Uh, we've been named Australia's most sustainable city twice in recent years. Uh, we've got air quality consistently better than other comparable capital cities. And last year, Council became a certified carbon neutral operation. No small feat when you see the size of our operations and the size of the landfill that we have to maintain. Um, we have, in terms of electric vehicles, uh, we've identified electric vehicles as a key priority in our Brisbane Clean, Green, Sustainable document. This is our document. It's online. We don't print lots of copies of it, but I have a copy here. This is our action plan for achieving our clean, green, sustainable vision for Brisbane. Uh, and we do have a lot of which to be proud. Clean air, a rich biodiversity, significant green cover, including 9,500 hectares of natural bushland. An uptake in the use of electric vehicles has many obvious benefits for a clean, green, sustainable city like ours, including our clean air, a vital attribute to making our city liv livable. Um, and as a council, we are focused on electric vehicle uptake in the community and have been working with industry and other levels of government to facilitate the establishment of a network of charging stations in strategic locations in Brisbane. Uh, these include shopping centres, car parks, uh, workplaces and popular recreation and tourist sites. We are working with the development industry to encourage EV recharging stations in new multi-unit residential and commercial buildings and providing technical guidance for developers in that regard. Um, Council's car park in King George Square in the city provides a recharging facility, has done so since 2012. It offers free electric vehicle recharging and discounted parking for electric and hybrid vehicles. We were an early adapter of low emission vehicles in our corporate fleet with our first hybrid vehicle in 2002 and electric vehicles coming on board in 2010. Um, we have a, a large fleet of vehicles uh, and unfortunately not a, a huge number of those are currently electric vehicles, but we do have nine electric vehicles in the passenger fleet and 43 hybrid vehicles, uh, which is over 25% of the passenger fleet. There are five hybrid trucks used in our construction division. So we are constantly trialling new innovations and do keep a close eye on the market to ensure we continue to be a leader in sustainability. For the past eight years, we've found that electric passenger vehicles have been suitable for many of our business purposes and are very well received by staff, with some choosing only to drive the low emission vehicles. We regularly, regularly display our EVs at our Greenheart sustainability fairs. Uh, we have uh, two big sustainability fairs, the Greenheart fairs 
twice a year and we've now putting the, the uh, EVs on display at those expos um, and that certainly does help to educate people on where to charge and the purchasing costs and I think that's one of the, the key questions we keep getting asked is the, the cost of the purchase of the equipment. Uh, we are looking at ways to reduce the emissions intensity of our vehicle fleet and that includes everything from street sweepers to large trucks. Um, we also have a, an extensive bikeway network which is made even more accessible with the growth of uh, electric powered bikes, scooters and hoverboards. I saw one the other day on the Kedron Brook if you know the north side of the city. Um, Brisbane City Council's transport plan was recently released and that will guide the evolution of Brisbane's transport network over the next 25 years. It provides a framework to ensure our city stays connected and livable into the future. The transport plan identifies the challenges and opportunities facing Brisbane and provides strategic transport directions and desired outcomes under four citywide themes. Enhanced livability, delivering economic benefits, harnessing innovation and evolving the network. And one of the desired outcomes of the transport plan is that the design and operation of transport networks minimise impact on the environment and help mitigate the impacts of climate change. Strategic direction supporting the outcomes includes encouraging reduction in private car travel by improving the attractiveness of sustainable transport options through high quality public and active travel infrastructure, promoting the uptake of low emission vehicles, electric vehicles and technology to improve vehicle efficiency, emissions and noise, improving the amenity and reducing impacts of the city's on the city's natural environment in the planning, design and retrofitting of transport infrastructure and design and, op and operation of transport networks in natural areas and waterways to protect the environment and ecological values. So they're things that we take very important, take uh, to heart in our planning purposes and you'll see those coming through in the implementation of things like the transport plan. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to support this conference. We look forward to hearing the outcomes from it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay for the Q&A session, but I have a very capable officer here, Frank Henry, who I think most of you know. He's our Pollution Policy Manager, and he'll be my proxy to answer any questions in the Q&A session that follows. Uh, but thank you very much again. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes from today's conference. Thank you. I guess that the Brisbane Council Chambers today are closed because I met two other nice people at the front and they uh, actually just exude the environment and uh, I think it's so impressive to see a council uh, represented by such fine people and thank you for uh, sponsoring the conference too. It's fantastic. Vision in council, rare. But great to see, great to see. I met Chris a minute ago and you can just tell when you meet someone they could achieve something great and that's our next speaker. As the recently appointed CEO of Fast Cities Australia, Chris Mills brings global experience in telco rollouts in Europe, the USA and the UK. We really should have got him to roll out the NBN. No matter, he's here today and would you please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Chris Mills from Fast Cities Australia. everybody. Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, July this year I was appointed as the uh, CEO of Fast Cities Australia and coincidentally four months ago I also started my journey in EVs. So I'm probably standing here talking to a room of people where everybody in this room knows more about EVs than I do. I sort of tend to think maybe I'm an L plater or maybe even just graduated to being a P plater. But uh, I want to share with you our vision of the uh, uh, nationwide electric vehicle charging network. My background, as John, uh, just John alluded to earlier, um, I've spent 25 years rolling out networks for the mobile and telecommunications operators, and I've done that uh, originally in Australia, and then I went into Europe, uh, finally in America, and have recently returned back to Australia. And there are a lot of parallels between the rolling out of a mobile network and the rolling out of an EV network. Both of them are distributed assets. Both of them require 
uh, the mobilisation of large forces who will work on, on independent sites under a program management regime. And that's fundamentally why I've, I've been brought into the organisation, to bring that scale, to turn it from an industry which is currently typified as being uh, the guy who turns up and knocks on the door and asks the landowner whether or not he or she is interested in a in, in, in siting an electric vehicle charging station, to um, a disciplined rollout program with, with professionals. So here's my vision of Fast Cities Australia. So firstly, we're backed by the St Baker Energy Innovation Fund. Uh, Trevor St Baker, who is the, uh, the family owner of the fund, has a vision. And that vision is to build a network of charging stations across Australia. And from that backing, we've managed to be able to assemble a team of disciplined uh, deployment specialists and equipment suppliers. So we have the ingredients of deploying a nationwide network of EV charging stations across the country. So let me talk to you about the EV trifecta. Many of you have probably seen this before. It comes from the CEFC. It talks about the three important ingredients for a sustainable EV take up in the country. It talks to reducing the price of the car. It talks to increasing model availability. And it talks to expanding the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure that's required. The dilemma you have, though, is in the absence of meaningful federal government policy, who makes the first step? Who goes first? Do the uh, automotive manufacturers make the leap and start to import models on the hope that somebody will build a network? Will drivers buy the vehicles, the limited model availability of vehicles that are in Australia today, in the hope that someone will build a network? Or will the, charging, will the charge point operator build a network hoping that um, increased model availability and uh, increasing take up of EVs will drive uh, the, the sales that are necessary, the revenue that's necessary to support the major infrastructure uh, capital investment? That's the dilemma. Well, we take the view, and we're lucky, being backed by the St Baker Energy Innovation Fund, Trevor is a visionary and is not tied to the, 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 the usual corporate, short to medium business term case justification that, in that obviously stifles this sort of investment by, by many companies. He can take that long term visionary view. And our view is this. We contend that if you build a network, that increases confidence in the industry. Confidence is an interesting point. I sat in the Senate Select Committee hearings here in Brisbane a couple of, uh, about a month ago, month, maybe six weeks ago. And I heard one of the witnesses and they spoke about confidence. Confidence to invest, confidence to buy, confidence to import. Where does that confidence come from? Who makes that first step? And our view is, if you build a network, you will increase confidence with the, op the automotive manufacturers to start to import models. Importing more models improves affordability. Really simple statistic. There are 16 plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles for sale in Australia today. Five of them are under $70,000. There, are, there happen coincidentally to be 16 battery electric operated vehicles that are available for sale in America, and they're all under $35,000. It's model availability that drives a reduction in price. Who gives the automotive manufacturer the confidence to bring those models into the country? It's the development of the charging network. So building the network gives confidence for the, uh, the automotive manufacturers to bring the models in, the models improve the affordability. The improved affordability stimulates demand. And that's our position. We want to take that step. Freed by the St Baker funding, we are going to, together with the Charge Fox network, let's not forget what they're doing as well, together with them, build a network of charging stations on, on our highways. So, 
you all know about this. I'm probably talking to, I don't know, 300 people here today. And there's probably, you, each of you, probably there are 300 home charging sites in your houses right now. We all know about home charging. 80% of charges will be done by home charging. You know? We're not talking necessarily about that. Destination charging, 50 kilowatt charges, now, essential for regional Australia development. You know, encouraging EV drivers to travel into regional Australia, you know, shop in the towns, um, uh, boost the economies. That's an important, important um, component of the, the EV fabric across the country. Brisbane City Council, just, just recently, um, David was talking about the plans that the Brisbane City Council have to expand destination charging in Brisbane City Council. Where we want to focus is on highway and commercial charging, the high capex, um, the, the high capex charging that uh, is needed to link our capital cities. Yeah. Why? Well, really simply, ultra fast charging is a game changer. What I show you here on the right hand side of the slide um, is a comparison of how long it would take to drive 1,000 kilometres using the three current forms of charging that exist. AC charging, 50 kilowatt fast charging, and 350 kilowatt ultra fast charging. And the, the numbers in the various uh, boxes are durations in minutes. So you drive for three hours, 190 minutes, and then on the AC you then charge for five hours. You drive for another three hours, you charge for another five hours. You get it. DC fast charging, you'd stop for about an hour, hour and 20 minutes to charge a car. Perfect if you, were, if you were going to spend some time in that regional town, you know. Opportunity for you to stop at the cafe, um, spend some money in the town, you know. Perfect for destination charging, you know, stopping at Westfield, stopping at Stocklands, going and doing your shopping, coming back an hour, hour and a half later and your car's charged. But if you want to make the trip from Brisbane to Sydney uh, without any major stops, then you need ultra-fast charging. And if these charges are located in service centres, then it actually enhances your experience because you, you go in, you plug the car in, and you can leave it. You can enjoy um, uh, stopping at uh, buying some food, um, having a break, stretching your legs, knowing full well that, that the car is safe being charged and come back in that 10 to 15 minutes, you, your phone, app on your phone tells you your car's at 80% charging, come back to your car and you're on your way. It's a game changer. And especially for a country like Australia, the, the vast geography that we have. Now, don't get me wrong, not all cars today can take the 350 kilowatt charge. I get that. But I don't actually have a network that's out there today. I'm deploying that network. It'll take me three years to do my first phase, which is 42 sites. In three years' time, next generations of vehicles will be um, imported. Those vehicles still may not be able to take a 350 kilowatt charge, but they'll be able to take better than a 50 kilowatt charge. So they'll be able to benefit from the infrastructure that is being deployed. So, what are we doing? As you can see on the map, we've got a bunch of uh, coloured lines. The orange, or yellow, and the red is our phase one. Our phase one is um, far north Queensland, and then from Gympie down to, uh, down to Sydney, uh, sorry, Gympie uh, down to Melbourne, from Melbourne out to Adelaide, and then we do some of Tasmania and some of Western Australia. That's our phase one rollout. And you can see the green is our phase two rollout, and the blue is our phase three. So we have a plan ultimately for deploying just under 400 sites across the country. But what are our design principles? And this is important. The first of our design principles is we are designing the spacing of the sites to support affordable EVs. There's no point having sites that are 250, 300 kilometres apart if half of the cars that, that would rely upon that charging network can't actually get between charges. Tesla's a perfect example. They've designed their network for their cars. It's a premium car, it has a big battery, it can drive a long way. We need to design our network to support affordable EVs. And one of the key, one of the key components of the design 
is that we provide a ring of sites around each of the major capital cities. Because you wake up in the morning, you get in your car, it's fully charged, and you drive to the outskirts of town. If you live in Sydney, or if you live in Melbourne, you might have used a quarter of your charge just to get to the outskirts of the town. And if the first site is 250 kilometres away, you're now starting to ask yourself the question, will I get there? And so our plan is to have these rings of sites around the edges of the towns so that you can top up and give you the confidence and then moving to the next charging location. Yeah? Interesting. We're also looking at, at uh, um, light commercial vehicles. One quarter of all vehicles travelled by light commercial vehicles are long, is long distance. And so we need to site these, our, our, our assets, to ensure that we are supporting the light commercial vehicle traffic as well. There needs to be enough of a, ne a network that we deploy that actually does stimulate uptake. We can't deploy 10 sites, you know, dust our hands together and say, and say job well done. 10 sites won't get anybody excited. It won't get the, the automotive manufacturers excited. It needs to be of sufficient scale to actually catalyse take up. We are genuinely taking a build it and they will come attitude. And to do that, you need to actually build something of sufficient scale to get people interested, to actually get them to take some action. It needs to link into our regions and improve regional utility. It can't just be a network between Brisbane and Melbourne, you know, down the Pacific Highway and down the Hume Highway. It has to be more. You know, currently, even with our phase one rollout, our plans are to have sites that extend out into New South Wales, in Victoria and out into Queensland, purposefully to connect into existing 50 kilowatt um, networks. The NRMA network in New South Wales, the Queensland Superhighway in, uh, um, in Queensland, the Superhighway in Queensland, etc. So we've purposefully designed the network so that it doesn't sit there as an island, but it connects into the existing 50 kilowatt uh, networks that are out there to improve regional utility. And finally, What we plan to do is to not just duplicate uh, with ChargeFox. We want to make sure that we add to the overall national fabric of EV infrastructure in the country. It doesn't serve anybody any good is, um, if we've got sites everywhere that ChargeFox has sites. It doesn't stimulate the take-up if there are big holes because we've just duplicated rollout. And so our rollout is complementary to the ChargeFox rollout and together with them, we build a network that will give the impetus for mo automotive companies to bring their models in, the price of the cars to come down and uh, demand to be stimulated. So, a call to arms. Where are our challenges? What are the things that we need to overcome to give us the confidence of rolling a network out on time and to offer the service at a price that makes sense to our customers. And there are three. Number one, consistent state and planning legislation, uh, consistent state and territory planning legislation. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, I've 25 years in the mobile industry. I've, I've enjoyed community action against you know, the location of towers. And then I've equally had, I've actually been in a, you want to hear a funny story? I, I was actually in, on a site one day and there was community action and in the, in, uh, um, in the crowd was one of the directors of the company I was working for. Yeah. And then I would get complaints that he didn't have very good coverage around his house. Now, don't get me wrong, there isn't anything averse at the moment with states and territories. The problem that you typically have is, this is new, and so when you present yourself to the local planning authority uh, to talk to them about seeking their consents for the development, they will typically come back to you and say, we don't really know much about this, we haven't formulated our policy, could you please wait? They don't have anything against it, but they're just not ready for you. Now, the good thing is, in Queensland and in New South Wales, there is now consistent legislation that is encouraging the siting of electric vehicle charging stations in various locations. And that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. It allows us to site our locations with confidence, knowing that we will have um, the consent, the as-of-right consent. 
but that, that legislation hasn't, has, doesn't exist in Victoria and the other states and territories yet. And so consistency of state and territory planning legislation is important for us. The second one is responsiveness for power connection. You've all, you know, had, you've got what your own experience is about, you know, how long it takes to get your power connected. Now, when I talk about responsiveness, I don't necessarily mean fast. I mean, fast is good, don't get me wrong. But what I am looking for is a predictability. Predictability in charging, uh, and sorry, predictability in connection. If, if 95% of the time I receive the power connection um, within four months of the application, then I can plan that in my rollout program. It's predictability that's important. I used to run a tower company many, many years ago and uh, I, I, I had my, my leadership team together and I asked them the simple question, what makes our portfolio valuable? And every single one of them put their hand up and said, the location of the sites. And I said, you're wrong. And I said, because if we are predictably bad at getting people onto our towers, it doesn't matter where they are, they'll build one right beside yours. It's the predictability of being able to get on. If they know 95% of the time they can get on my site 10, in 10 weeks, they will pick my site every day of the week regardless of whether it's the best RF outcome or not. They'll do it. And we're looking for the similar predictability from the power utilities. If we know 95% of the time and we know the process and we are um, and, and we're accountable for following that process, then we can, we can fold that into our planning. And the last one is demand charge reform. Demand charge reform so that I can offer a good value service to the customer. 50% of my cost of sale is in demand charges. Now, that's the same for a lot of other companies that buy electricity. However, this is my cost of goods. This is my entire cost of goods. And if I can reduce the demand charge, I can reduce the cost to the consumer. And so they're my three challenges. Now I'd like to leave you with a bit of a thought. Cast your mind out in 10 years time, 15 years time, to a concept called mobility as a service. Mobility as, as a service um, requires three things. An on-demand business model, like Uber. It requires the electrification of transportation and it requires the development of autonomous vehicles. The future is home delivered. The future is ride, ride sharing and, uh, sorry, uh, car sharing and, and ride hailing, displacing personal vehicle ownership. The future is mobility as a service providing you with all of the transport optionality that you need at 10 to 15% of the cost of conventional ownership of a vehicle. But for mobility as a service to, uh, to grow, it requires reliable, ubiquitous electrification and charging networks. And Fast Cities Australia wants to be at the forefront of that transformation. Now, how many of you have heard the marketing saying, um, you never sell the sizzle, you sell the steak. Uh, no, sorry, you never sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the sizzle today. If you really want to know more about what we are planning, then I encourage you to, 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 to stay until four o'clock where our head of planning and technology, Dr. Andrew Simpson, will be providing a lot more detail on our plans going forward. But thank you very much. So just a reminder, Brisbane Council and Fast Cities Australia. Any questions? No policy statements? Don't need to prove you're smart. We know you are, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You'd be at Supernova next door. Young lady, just behind you there, young Bryce. Um, hi, thanks for um, your presentation today. I just wanted to ask what the, if there is a time frame for rollout of the um, infrastructure network that you're planning. Yeah, yeah there is. Um, our first phase will take which is the first 42 sites, that will take three years. Our intention is to have our first 16 sites, which is between Brisbane and Melbourne, completed by the end of next year. So that's, that's, our, that's our current high level planning. Questions? 
Young man down the front there, Bryce. Hi, uh, my name's Jason. Question for Brisbane City Council. Do you have any plans to electrify your bus fleet um, and your um, like garbage trucks and that kind of thing? Yeah, the noisy stuff. Um, the council has been trialling electric buses, been trialling hybrid buses, a number of technologies, so it has been trialling electric buses. Um, also uh, trialling um, light like commercial vehicles and um, the contract for the waste collection vehicles has only recently been let a few years ago, so the, when the next contract for um, rubbish collection and trucks etc, because the, the rubbish collection is actually done by contractors, not by the council, unlike the buses, so um, the, uh, that it will be considered as part of the I guess the contract in terms of desirability of the contract, whether the company has zero emission vehicles will be one of the factors considered. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Look, quick question. The uh, EV rollouts as far as the network's concerned, you said you're complementary to the other 50 kilowatt systems. How are you integrating with the payment selection? Uh, so as end consumers, we're going to end up with you know, 10, 15 different cards and subscriptions and so on. No, no. Our, our philosophy is we want an open network. Um, any form of payment uh, is, is accepted. Um, we, we, will, we will enter into, um, uh, what do they call them? Um, roaming agreements with, thank you, Paul. We'll enter into roaming agreements with, uh, with the other networks uh, so that it becomes easy for the customer to be able to take a charge, whether it be with the RFID card of, of the other network, whether it be swiping your credit card, whether it be you, know, you dial a number and the operator talks you through the process. Uh, we wanted to make it uh, open for, for all users. We, we take the same philosophy um, as uh, is currently um, uh, moving towards in California, where, where, you, where there's no requirement for you to be a, a, a subscriber to the network for you to be able to access the sites. Good question. Um, hello, hello, hi. Um, my question is to do with the charging, um, in particular the price. Will it reflect the duck curve where you'll charge more at peak times and less during the day? Have you thought about that kind of stuff? Yeah, we have. We're still working through the, the, the pricing models. Um, there's still some work to do with regards to working through the pricing models to give ourselves the confidence that we can give a competitive price and still make the return on the investment given that there's a, quite a high capex involved. Someone's suggesting price gouging already? <laughs> nice. Question from Dr Jones? Uh, yeah, quick question about um, uh, power supply at various sites. Obviously you'll pick sites with good, um, good utilities but uh, there are many sites on that map that don't have that. Um, have you guys considered battery buffering these charging networks? And I know that is an expensive option, but in some cases it mightn't be such a bad idea. Um, are you considering that? Um, the short answer is, uh, for the first phase, it will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, interestingly, if you've, got, if you've got difficulty getting the power in, sometimes you've got actually difficulty getting the power out as well. So we, we don't necessarily know where the batteries is, um, is the solution, but we're certainly looking at it. I mean, for us, um, our network, what, what we're building for our network is a, um, we're, we're, we're future-proofing our network. Um, so we're, we're not necessarily going what you would call capex light. We are, we are building the infrastructure for six charging heads at our sites, um, and then we are only installing two to start with, but then you have the ability as demand drives um, additional utilisation, or utilisation drives um, the, 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 um, the investment, it's easy for us to add that addi the additional heads. Um, what that typically then means is we're looking for a medium voltage power connection you know, and, a, and, a, and a big 1.25 MVA transformer. Um, and that's, uh, you know, we will make that investment uh, because we see, uh, we'll make that investment um, because we see that as being um, the prudent thing to do, you know, with a long term view. I think you've answered my question. Um I'm assuming all of these stations will be grid connected and there's, uh, uh, or are you looking at alternative uh, energy sources to, uh, to source the power from? No, at the moment we are looking at grid connection. Yep. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely future thoughts. Right now, my focus is getting those first 42 sites on the ground. Frank, is everything that Brisbane Council developed available to the other councils? Like, could I go to your website, download stuff, and take it to my local council? In regards to planning? Yeah, issues? just just everything that you've shown that David mentioned to and the others have alluded to. Is that available for yeah. any of us to take to our local council? That's Yeah, all the information is Open on our source. website, yeah, certainly. Um, but uh, the, probably the most valuable for other councils, apart from all the fleet information, because the council has probably two strong roles. One is um, purchasing and uh, using electric vehicles itself in its own fleet, and that's what, something that all local governments could do. Mm. But the second thing is our, our major, I guess, point of influence is in the planning uh, side of things, because every council has its own planning scheme, and in, in ensuring that in regards to development assessment you make it easy uh, or you make it uh, desirable to install the infrastructure for um, charging, et cetera, in, in the development. And we're currently developing, we're looking at um, planning scheme, codes and the like, and that's something that um, all councils could uh, also copy of be available to us. Excellent. Well, we've got 38 councils in Tasmania for a population of 500,000 people, and they're all talking about it, but no one's actually doing anything. Last question in the front there, sir. I'll take that personally. Councillor Rick Babarowski from the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> Transport portfolio. Uh, Chris, look, um, appreciate you have to start somewhere. And the 42 sites are based essentially, it looks like, on a, a judgment about mileage, uh, distances about mileage, getting from a major capital to a major capital. I'd suggest that's not the only anxiety. In fact, I think one of the major anxiety is the time uh, available to you on a charge. Uh, because if anybody's um, going to the Sunshine Coast on the weekend, you'll know that you could be doing an hour and a half trip or you could be doing a three and a half hour trip depending on the congestion. And you could have a breakdown or somebody could have an accident. That level of anxiety about what will happen to my charge, depend regardless of the distance, is I think quite a big factor. But appreciate that, you know, look, You've got to start somewhere. I understand that the network is designed uh, to really look at that distance, but would you like to comment on how do we overcome that sort of uh, scenario that's in most people's minds about you know, going from petrol to hybrid to electric? That's a, that's, a, that's a very difficult question to answer straight away. I know, that's why I asked it. <laughs> um, what, what I will say, though, is, is, is and, and I, I want to talk to you know, our fellow charge point operators, charge folks. One of the great things that they did was actually bringing together the automotive um, clubs um, as investors in their network. Not that I particularly want to talk up an, 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 another charging point operator, but in doing that, they will drive the automotive clubs and their motoring services division to actually really start to consider and work out how do we deal with the growth of electric vehicles, how do we provide that service so that that fear that the car breaks down and I don't know who to call to actually come and have it get fixed gets alleviated. So th that, to me, that to me is one of the keys here. And we need to make sure that we are working together with them, regardless of the fact that they're running a, an, an alternative um, network, working with them to make sure that the automotive uh, clubs and their, um, uh, their maintenance services um, are actually skilled um, and that their club members know who to contact and how to get them there. Fantastic. Uh, you're not leaving straight away, Chris? No, no, I'll be here. All day. There you go. So there's a bit of power networking in the lounge next door. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Frank Henry from the Brisbane Council and Chris Mills from Fast Cities Australia. Thank you, gentlemen.